trying to uh, queue up video number two. music <laughs> thanks Thank you. So that was uh, that was Jumpy Bug, one of my one of my favorites. If we go to the next slide, here's another creature. Um, this one was evolved actually for a problem that's normally, as it turns out, I didn't realize when I first built it, but through experiment I've discovered that it's actually a fairly difficult problem. Um, uh, the idea is that there, once the creature is put into the world, there are balls, spheres that fall from the sky at regular intervals in a particular location, and what the creatures goal is to catch one of those balls and then transport it as far as it can uh, without letting the ball touch the ground. And if you watch carefully in this video, uh, you can see the small sphere uh, fall from the sky, strike the creature, bounce and roll into a little pocket that has evolved at the front of the creature on its right side. The ball gets wedged in there and the creature then bounds off across the ground and the ball does not become dislodged. And so this was... Um, most runs fare uh, extremely poorly with this problem, and so this creature is really the current reigning champion uh, for the sphere transporting problem. So that's video number three. I'll get Brian to key that up. Thank you. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, this is, uh, this is awesome. my favorite. Yeah, this is the best one of all. <laughs> uh, this is absolutely my favorite. So of all the creatures that I've produced on my own, that, that my volunteers have produced, this one was initially evolved by one of my volunteers, and then I evolved it further on my own machine. Uh, this is absolutely my favorite. Um, it was evolved to traverse across uh, just a flat ground, uh, so no bumpy terrain, no, no catching any spheres. But the interesting twist on this particular configuration was that this creature's brain has no oscillators. And an oscillator is a, is a little component in the brain that can generate a, a sine wave signal. And these, these tend to be very useful for allowing good limb movements. You, you strap a sine wave signal and the limb tends to make a repetitive movement over and over. Um, and so in this particular example, I said, okay, no oscillators. You've got to find some other way to figure out how to move. Uh, and in fact, uh, not only did it find another way, it, it, it really excelled. So I'll get Brian to, to play this one. It's video number four. I love this one. these orange boxes was that supposed to be the brain or the eyes or no nope. um actually each body part um has its own little brain um and there is also a brain that's sort of meant to, to govern the uh, the whole creature but mostly the 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 intelligence is distributed throughout all the body parts um body parts have no designation so there's there's nothing that really corresponds to eyes or head or feet or it's just 
uh, whatever evolution happens to hit upon and, 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 and whatever happens to work, uh, we as humans can look at it and say, oh yeah, that's clearly the head and these are clearly feet. But as far as the program is concerned, all body parts are the same type. So there's so nothing special about it. chromosome that you showed us where it was divided into four or five parts that were different colors, was that colored randomly? Or did you design it so that the different oh, yeah. colors would mean different things? I gotcha. I gotcha. In fact, the colors are selectively neutral. So in other words, the color of a body part has absolutely no effect on the performance. And so the colors are subject to what's called genetic drift. Uh, they can simply change and it makes no difference. Over time they will change, but it has nothing to do with how fit the creatures are. Okay. Alright? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, what I love about that creature is it's got it's got no oscillators and so it's it's really constantly responding to the it, its environment and you'll notice that when it sort of topples over it very elegantly and gracefully is able to get back up again which is pretty cool so if we go to uh, the next slide uh, a very interesting thing that one learns when one is attempting to evolve things in the computer and especially for the 3d creatures is that evolution does not care what you want um, so basically evolution is going to look at the fitness function that you've given it and uh, if that fitness function doesn't correspond to what you had in your head that you'd like to see evolve, uh, that's too bad. So you have to be careful. Uh, if we go to the next slide, what can happen is you get these creatures that are, even in the literature, these things are some kind, sometimes called cheaters. And so that is, these are creatures that satisfy the fitness function, but they aren't what you have in mind. And so one, I'll, I'll give you an example of when I was trying to evolve creatures to jump. What I first did was I said, well, I'm going to have to determine a location for the creature. How can I do that? I said, well, what I'll do is I'll take an average of the location of every body part. And I'll say, that's the creature's location. Well, the creatures immediately started exploiting this. And what they did was, instead of jumping, uh, they would evolve to be really, really, really tall. And they would have a lot of body parts, even though they're tiny, a lot of body parts way, way up at the top. And so when you take the average of all the body part positions, that drags that point way up high into the sky, and they think, you know, wow, I'm jumping, right? So I, uh, in fact, they weren't jumping at all. If uh, Brian will queue up video number five, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. So one way I got around this was I said, okay, well, instead of taking the average of all the body parts, it would be much better if I actually calculated the center of mass. So then if you, if you have a lot of tiny body parts, it's not going to sway the center of mass. So if we go to the next slide, let's imagine that you are the designer of this program and you say, I would like to evolve creatures that jump. So you've solved this first problem that I encountered. You said, okay, we'll use center of mass. We won't use average body part location. So what I'll say is your fitness is how high off the ground can you get? So how, how high up does the center of mass get during the simulation? And that'll be a measure of how well it's jumping. It seems like a perfectly, perfectly logical solution, but you still get cheaters. Uh, what happens is you evolve creatures that are just very tall. Um, they're not jumping, but they have a high center of mass. Evolution doesn't care that, in fact, you wanted jumpers. Uh, it'll evolve really tall creatures. So if we go to the next slide, you might think to yourself, well, what I'll do to get around that then is I'll look at how high up the center of mass goes, and I'll also look at how low down it goes. And I'll look at the difference in between. So in other words, I want to see it go from a low position up to a high position. And that'll be how well it jumped. And I'll say, okay, I'll make that the fitness function. Well, in fact, evolution has a way of, of, uh, of sticking it to you. Uh, what it can do is it, it can evolve really tall creatures that simply fall over. So they have a, a very high center of mass at the beginning. And they simply topple over and fall to the ground. And that brings their center of mass down. And so you get a pretty good fitness, but it's not what you had in mind. If we go to the next slide. What's interesting about yep. that, though, is they're all fulfilling exactly what you asked them to do. Exactly my point. Yeah. Evolution doesn't care what you want. It only cares about the fitness function you give it, which is, which is, it can lead to some interesting things. So if we go to slide number 34, 